Learning Measure TV, a science and engineering podcast with emphasis on measurement, brought to you by David Archer and LearningMeasure.com. Episode 25, Histograms and Creative Charts. Hello, I'm David Archer. I'm uh, owner of LearningMeasure.com and LearningMeasure.tv. Um, LearningMeasure.com is a subscription-based uh, website, training website. Uh, when you sign and register as a student, you get two weeks of free access to the courses. After that, the access is $5 a month uh, to maintain your subscription and your records. Uh, I'd like to announce the following courses that have been just added to the course catalog. Quality 152, QC Tools, Flowcharts and Process Maps. Quality 153, QC Tools Check Sheets. Qual uh, Q Qual 154, QC Tools Histograms. These are three of eight short courses on the seven basic tools of quality, uh, as defined by Ishikawa. Uh, and uh, this uh, um, podcast is this podcast series, we're going to basically cover some of the seven basic to the seven basic tools. The reason why we're doing that is because that's part of uh, the ASQ certified calibration technician exam body of knowledge, of which we're trying to develop a program for. Um, also, I want to announce that it's pot prop in June. We're going to reduce the um, free trial period to one week um, uh, and we, because we, we really need to. Um, but uh, we also are announcing that uh, we're going to have some new ways that you can offset the cost of your subscription if you would like. We are going to do some, uh, I would need to do some, uh, get some feedback forms together and if you are interested, um, tell, send us uh, an email, go into the news on, or anything, but send an email saying you're interested. We will s randomly pick people fr from the people that are interested, people to send surveys to. Uh, we're trying to get some feedback on some of the courses and some of the interface and that sort of thing. And we will pay, pay you uh, $10 per survey for six, um, up to six surveys. So basically, for those who are picked randomly, you, you can get a year's subscription paid for if you'd like to use, if that's what you'd like to use the money for, uh, for participating in the survey. So if you're interested, you need to send me an email um, at, uh, well, info at uh, learningmeasure.com and say that you would, are interested in uh, taking part in the survey. And uh, we will randomly pick a few from there to, um, um, and, oh, and another thing, this is only going to be open to U.S. residents at the moment. We will probably expand this to the rest of the world shortly. But right now, we're interested in getting feedback from U.S. residents. Um, and so if you're interested in doing that, you can offset the cost of a year subscription if you would like. Um, we also are interested in people who, to join our consultant network and develop uh, course materials. We're going to start posting more uh, things up for bid on, on the website if you're interested in developing some things for us uh, that we will pay for. I just thought you should know that that's coming. Anyway, today we're going to talk about three of the seven tools, the check sheet, the histogram, and the Pareto diagram, or Pareto chart. We'll start out with the check sheet. What is a check sheet? Well, check sheet is supposed to be a simple way to collect data, basically count data. Um, not, not things like numeric data, like temperature or things like that, although it could be a range of temp you know, things in a range of temperatures. No, the, quick, the check sheet is for counts, count data. How many are in this category? So you're going to cat f f come up with different categories or classes that you're going to bin the data in. And that's usually the term used, bin or binning, because you're putting things in different bins. Um, 
and uh, it's meant to be a simple tool. A simple tally sheet is probably the simplest one where you just decide what the categories are and then you just start counting the, the what's in each category. For instance, if you're a manufacturer of computers and all your computer models are named after fruits or something, uh, then you might have a tally sheet that looks like this. Okay, and you would just count, the <coughs> in this case, you know, it's defects or returns or some such thing. And uh, in this case, you see that your banana model might have some problems. Simple data collection tool. Another example might be, oh, you're trying to collect data on two variables at once. Like you want to see if, if you're in a manufacturing process and you have like four manufacturing machines and you want to see if day of the week is a factor. And um, so you might make a chart like this where you have a, on uh, one way you have the day of the week and the other axis you have uh, the machine and then you have in the boxes you just count the defects and then you total them up at the edges. And you can see that maybe a particular machine may have a different problem. Maybe you notice that at the beginning of the week um, everything's fine but by Friday things are, are falling apart. Maybe it is that on Monday everybody you know calibrates their machine and by Friday the cal uh, loosens up and maybe you'll have to change the process to have people recal their machines on Wednesday or something. But you, you don't know what the cause is yet when you're collecting the data. Uh, the other thing it might be a location sheet. Let's say you were building chairs and you wanted to find defects, you know, characterize where defects are on the chair. Here's an example of a check sheet for doing that. You know, you just divide up the type of defects you're looking for and then you mark on the, on the, on the thing where they are. Uh, everybody's experienced this who's rented a car pretty much in the United States. The, the, there's um, typically someone goes around with a check sheet on a car with you and walks around the car and marks the locations of scratches and dings and that sort of thing to know what the car, state of the car is when it left with you. That's another reason why you might want to use a check sheet. Other thing is, is you can break up continuous data into bins, ranges, and count how many in that bins. Like you could say, well, how many defects as a function of temperature range or time or uh, weight or something like that, intensity of some sort. Um, so how, uh, the whole thing about check sheets is they're supposed to be simple ways of collecting data. If it's complicated, it's, you should, probably shouldn't use a check sheet. You probably should use some automated data collection tool or something. It's meant for simple processes where humans are collecting the data. Okay, how do you implement a check sheet? Well, first of all, you have to identify what problem you're going to try to investigate. If you don't know what the problem is, you can't generate the check sheet. Then you have to identify all the potential factors. Now this is probably done in some sort of brainstorming session or something, but you need to write down all the factors that you think could inf be influencing what you're seeing. And then, now, I'm, like I said, there's more complicated tools to do some of this stuff. This is the simple tool that we're talking about. This is supposed to be very simple. And then you decide what, from all the factors that could affect what you're looking at, you need to down select to the, uh, the number that you're actually going to try to collect. And once you have the categories uh, that you want to collect data for, then you design the check sheet. It, and there are no fast rules on, on designing check sheets. The only thing is they have to be simple, simple that a human can use, and that they're for collecting count data, not numbers. If you have to write down a number, it's not a check sheet. You're try you want, you know, count things. Okay, then an important process in implementing a check sheet after that is training. Now first of all, basically everyone who's collecting the data should understand why the data is being collected. That's sort of a given, but that probably should be part of the training. They should be trained in how to use the check sheet. Now if it's so complicated that it takes more than, I don't know, five minutes to explain how to use the check sheet, it's probably too complicated. It's meant to be a simple process for collecting data. 
But the most important thing, you need to under make sure that your people are trained to understand what the, what the defect is. If they don't know how to recognize a defect, the data is going to be off. So the most important thing is they have to be trained sufficiently to understand what they're counting. That more than anything is you've got to make sure that they're trained in. Implementation. Once, you, once you've trained your, you've designed your check sheet, you've decided what you're going to collect data, you've designed your check sheet, you're going to implement the process now. You've done your training, you implement the process. First thing you should do is do a trial run, a short run of collecting data. Then at the den you do and analyze the data and then you make any adjustments to the check sheet or to the process or anything to the training to make sure that uh, based on that trial run in case there was some issues with how you were collecting data, then you actually go collect the data. After you collect the data, you need to analyze the data. Now some of the tools that you're going to use to analyze the data might be a histogram or a Pareto chart, which we'll talk about in a minute. And once you've analyzed the data, it may, may, maybe the data indicates you have to do further investigation. You need to look and to see why this machine is doing this or whatever. Uh, how come this, at this temperature thing, weird things happen? Um, you have to do some sort of investigation. And then finally, you have to act on your analysis. Once you've identified something, you need to um, make some change. And with all quality things, you then repeat the whole process again because you need to know if the change you did made um, did anything. If you, if, you don't, if, you do, if you just make a change and don't look again, you don't know if you've made any progress. So you really have to repeat. It's a continuous process. Okay, now we're going to talk a little bit. Now you've got your data, what you do with it. Well, at the check sheet, you've already divided uh, your uh, uh, data into bins. And now we're, you create a hist we can One of the things you could do is create a histogram. So what is histogram? Well, some sort of plot. And what it is is a series of rectangles. They may be different sizes, different di dimensions of some sort. You know, they might look like this. Now this particular case, we're going to be looking at a continuous ranges where the categories are some sort of t continuous data like time, temperature, date, you know, weight, something. Um, so that it's broken up into numer numerical ranges. Now a histogram, the, the number of it, um, the, the, the key characteristic of a histogram is the area of the rectangle is proportional to the number of counts in it. Not the height, but the area, okay? You've seen this before if you've seen any of our podcasts on statistics, something like a probability density function where the area under the curve represents um, a, a probability. Well, and, I, and then that previous podcast where I said you could take a, something like a, a probability density function and determine the area by breaking it up into rectangles. What you're doing here in the case of continuous data is the opposite. You're generating these rectangles to come up with some approximation of the probability density function or something that's proportional to a probability density function, actually. So what you do, an area of a rectangle, of course, is the base times the height. Well, since this is area is proportional to the number, the number is going to be some constant of proportionality that indicates how many, what area corresponds to what number times the base, well, times the base times the height. So the height of the rectangle is going to be N over CB. The number in the, in the bin divided by the constant divided by the base width. Now this is only for continuous data, okay? So this, so your what your your counts approximate some sort of probability density function. I mean that's probably more than you need to know to do a histogram, but but uh, basically that's what it is. You'd have the areas of the rectangles. Now if your if your categories aren't continuous data, then what you do is uh, something more 
along lines of something that Excel does. In which case you make all, let's say your, your, your data was by machine or, or something like that. What you do then is you make all the bases the same size, in which case the height is going to be the um, proportional to the area. It's still a histogram because the bases are all the same size, but, but you would do something like this now, and this is what Excel and other programs do. You will break it up into classes and it might do something like this, where all the bases are, rough, are, are exactly the same size and you put list the labels for the categories under here. And notice I didn't have, I don't have the rectangles touching. That can tell you at a glance by looking at a histogram like this, also called a bar chart. A bar chart is a, is a histogram where all the bases are equal and uh, that are, represent discrete de categories. When you draw this chart, you separate each of the rectangles by some space. And that's a quick visual indication that this is uh, discrete data that you're collecting, not con continuous range data. So if you just look at a, a bar chart like this and you see gaps there, that basically is telling you discrete categories, not continuous range bins. Okay. So what can you do with um, uh, uh, one of these uh, histograms? Well, as I was saying before, with continuous range data, which I'll talk about for now for a little bit, you can do more than with, with this data. This tells you counts in categories. And it's useful because it does tell you how the data is distri distributed among the categories. You can do, learn a little bit more from continuous range data. For instance, you can quickly look at the distribution, come up with an estimate of the center and the width. Like this particular one here, you're going to see the center is fairly obvious, and you can basically say what the width is. Um, you can quickly see if there are any outliers. If you see this nice bell curve, and then you got a point way over here, that's probably an outlier of some sort. An outlier is a point that comes from a dist different distribution. It may not be an outlier. It might just be statistically it's, you know, every once in a while something's going to come out there. But it, maybe it's data that you don't really need to look at because it's not really part of the distribution you're trying to measure. The other thing you can look at is the number of modes. Modes are um, basically peaks in the, in the probability density function. It's max, local maxima of the, of the um, distribution. For instance, you could have one, two, or three modes. Here's an example of a bimodal distribution. It means there are two modes. It looks like there's two peaks to the distribution, separated for some reason. That in itself does tell you something about the data set that you're, you're um, taking. Now, once you've got, um, the other thing you can look at is something called skew. Here's an example of a plot that has some skew to it, which means basically the distribution's not symmetrical. It's sort of skewed to one side. Most of the data is on one side or the other. There's actually, an, uh, um, and I think we went over it in a previous podcast, there is a statistical concept called skew where you put a number to it, but, the, but with these histograms, you can sort of see real quick if the data is skewed. Okay, Pareto diagram. Okay, first of all, I'm going to tell, say a little bit about Pareto. This guy's Pareto here. He lived from 1848 to 1923. He was probably best known as an uh, uh, economist. But he also did other things, sociologist, philosopher, that sort of thing. He has a PhD in engineering. Um, probably best known for, uh, best attributed uh, to him is the 80-20 rule, where he actually sort of made the statement that uh, uh, about Italy, um, that 80% uh, of the wealth was held by 20% of the individuals. Uh, that's what he was bas basically famous for. He was part of the government of uh, Mussolini, um, and uh, early he did praise some of the accomplishments of the fascists. He was, he was uh, uh, although he was not too happy apparently about uh, um, 
the uh, curtailing of intellectual feelings, uh, freedoms at universities, but I don't know, he was part of the fascist government. And he wasn't particularly um, instrumental in, in uh, developing something that's att attached to his name, the Pareto chart, and Pareto principle, and that sort of thing. Really, that's this guy, uh, uh, Duran, who lived from 1904 to February of 2008, so he just recently passed away. Uh, he's generally considered the father of quality. Um, uh, he uh, uh, sort of elevated the Pareto principle that, you know, there's this thing called a 2080 rule, well, but, or, you know, which is sort of pseudoscientific uh, thing that, you know, 80% 80, 80 of your effects are caused by 20% of your causes is generally how people think about it. But Duran, you know, basically broke the data into um, what he called the vital few and the important many, and in between was the awkward zone. But we'll, we'll talk about that in a minute. But uh, Pareto's the one, or Duran's the one who elevated the Pareto principle to something that could be in quality. He's the one who basically was popularizing the Pareto chart. It wasn't really Pareto. It probably should be called a Duran chart and Duran's principle. In fact, some, now they've gone to calling it Duran's Pareto principle. It was really Duran who, who uh, was the one who was responsible for this, but that's an aside. Okay, now, what a, what a Pareto diagram is, is you tar start with your histogram. It's basically a histogram, except what you do is you sort the rectangles by, in a Pareto diagram, you're going to go equal basis, okay? So you're going to sort them by size, so the number of counts. Um, so what you're going to do is you'll take all your data and then you'll, uh, well, hopefully they're all the same size. Uh, excuse my drawing ability. And so it's monotronically de decreasing. And then so you, so this over here, axis over here, you're going to have your category names down here. Let's call them one, two, three, just for, but they could be anything. This could be, you know, color or weight or some such thing. And the weight, in this case now, this axis is going to be counts, you know. So this will be like N1, this will be N2, whatever this is. Okay, N3 all the way down to whatever, which is the number of counts in each bin. Then the next thing you do is you come up and you add up all of them in, in all of them, you know, yeah, you come up with some number, N total, it's going to be N1 plus N2 plus, and then you compute, for the first bin, you compute N1 over NT, times 100 to get percent. And on the other side, you have a chart that goes from basically 0 to 100 percent. And let's say this was, oh, I don't know, 10 percent of the data. Let's say this first one is 10 percent. So you go, well, okay, that's about 10. You'd plot that point here. Then you go, okay, for this one, let's, you're going to want a cumulative total. The next plot you point is N1 plus N2 over N total times 100, and then you would plot that point. Okay, and then the next point you would go N1 plus N2 plus N3 divided by NT times 100, and then you plot that one. And you can get the general idea, then you connect the dots. So it might look like this. So that the, whoops, made a mistake here. Obviously it ends at 100%. So then you connect the dots, 
and that is your basic Pareto chart. Of course, that's probably not how that looks for this data, but you get the idea. Now, what Duran wanted to do is separate the data into what he called the um, vital few and the uh, important many. And what you do is you look for knees, which are places where sh slope changes happen. If you look at here, this sort of somewhere, if you sort of look at the, the graph, there looks like there's like two slopes here. And this re region right here, he would have labeled something like the awkward zone. But in here, this is the, you draw a line here. Everything to here is in the, is the uh, vital few. And this way is the important many. And the whole idea is you want to spend your time solving problems on this side, not over here. It's not often the case that a Pareto principle will be involved. In other words, that the majority of your effects are caused by a, a small number of the causes. This data, actually, if you look at this data, it doesn't have that property. But there are some data sets that do. And uh, what it does, what the Pareto diagram does for you, is uh, it tells you where the most important places to look. You know, where the biggest return on investment in your investigation is going to be. That's the real uh, purpose of the Pareto chart. So, and Pareto analysis is to basically identify what those causes are. Okay, that's it for this week. Um, that's what I wanted to talk about. Uh, we'll, next week time, we'll, we'll continue on uh, with this series until we're finished. But um, we are, we do have, we really do have an interview scheduled. Well, it's probably, but it might not, might not happen by the next time. So if there's an interview, there might be in, in there. Um, also, so if you have any suggestions uh, for what you want to see here, send us an email at suggestions at learningmeasure.tv. Uh, if you have any questions that you'd like answered, you could even do a video question. We'd love to get a video question or even a suggestion. Um, send it to questions at learningmeasure.tv. And if you are, want to be part of our consultant network or you want to uh, be on the podcast to show your product or, or whatever, uh, or want to do a, just be on here, do a technical talk, or even if you're, like I said, near retirement and or retired and would like to pass on your knowledge, uh, send us a call at vendors at learningmeasure.tv and uh, t tell us what you have in mind. Uh, that's it for this week. I'll see you next time.